there, everybody. That's quite an introduction to live up to. Um, but what I want to do today is talk a bit about data security, but not in the traditional way. So I'll come to that a bit more in a minute. But it takes, it can take about five minutes to get a WordPress site up and running these days. Very simple, very quick. But it's easy when we're doing things that quickly to lose sight that we've got anywhere between one and thousands of users that are using that site that we've just created. And we have a responsibility to ensure that the data we capture within that site is looked after. GDPR has sort of brought that into legislation, but some of the things I'm going to talk about today Although GDR, GDPR implies some of it, it doesn't actually explicitly talk about it. But it's all stuff that we need to look after. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to follow how our data flows through the system from the point of the user onwards. So why me? Well, I've been in IT since 1977. Uh, during that time, I've done pretty much every role within IT, uh, technical support, add the lobotomy, I'm now a project manager, uh, I've done DBA work, development work, whatever, and just to put that date into perspective, that's six years before the internet, that's eight years before mobile phones, that's 11 years before laptops, that's 17 years before the web, and 26 years before WordPress. In other words, I'm old. <laughs> but it does mean to say, I've seen a fair bit. Um, so, the things I'm, we need to think about. Why should we really care about users' data? Well, it's the right thing to do. And now that's been put into legislation with GDPR, it sort of bolstered that feeling up. It's important that we remember that we subcontract responsibility sometimes to third parties. We'll look at that in a minute. But when we do that, we're not subcontracting our accountability. We're still accountable for our websites. We need to ask questions of those people that we subcontract to to make sure that they are going to protect our users' data in the way we need them to and the way our customers would expect us to do on our own. So, I'm not going to go into the GDPR side of things. Heather was on earlier before me. We've got this great new feature within WordPress as of the latest replete, um, release, which gives us the privacy policy, which is absolutely brilliant. And there are loads of talks on WordPress TV from Heather all about GDPR. Pick one, any one of them is great. And I'm not going to talk about the, the traditional stuff about security, which is viruses, hacking, security plugins, and all that sort of stuff. If you want to know about that, I really recommend going to WordPress TV again and looking at a talk from Tim Nash. He does, he does a great talk on all of that stuff. So let's start our journey. First of all, we start with our users and their devices. We have no control over this at all. We have no way of knowing what the, what the users will get up to. And believe me, they can get up to pretty much anything. Uh, so we'll leave that bit alone because we can't control it. First stop on our users' data when, our, when we get our visitors coming to our website, is the data center. Now, these days, data centers are either one of two things. They're either a very large data center that's sitting as a cloud service, so aka Amazon, uh, Microsoft, uh, but it could be a bespoke data center that's being used. Uh, people like Rackspace, UK Fast, Telehouse or Blade Room. The important thing about this is 
or the important information we need to be conscious of is where that data center is. Because where that data center is, is likely to impact what the legal jurisdiction is that governs that data center. So, for instance, if that data center is in the US and the people who own it are part of the Privacy Shield, more about that later, that's probably okay. However, if that data center is somewhere in the Far East, then what level of security and privacy and care are they obliged to look to use for our data? The other thing is, who owns the infrastructure within that data center? Because that, again, decides who may have access to that information. So, for instance, if somebody in government nefariously decided that they wanted to collect data about voters who voted against them in a recent election, so that would take action against them in some way or target them in some way, would where the data center infrastructure and who own the data center infrastructure mean that that owner would have to give up that data to whoever it is that's asking for it. Now, it's not going to happen, right? It's very unlikely. Hold that thought. When it comes to, I've just mentioned Privacy Shield, but there's also something in EU legislation called adequacy. And the EU has listed a series of countries that are deemed to have privacy legislation that meets EU requirements. So there's the list as it, as it stands at the moment. You'll notice that the US is in there, but it's limited to something called the Privacy Shield Framework. We'll have a look at that in just a minute. What we'll see is that that means it's not the whole of the US, it's a subset thereof. So Privacy Shield. Who remembers something called Safe Harbor? Safe Harbor was a what should we call it? It was an agreement that the EU had with the US, where the US says, yeah, Europe, we understand that you've got all these privacy re requirements. We will actually set something called, called Safe Harbor, which says we will adhere to your privacy level of legislation if we're going to do business with you guys. Well, basically, the US trouble over it, uh, the EU threw the toys out the problem and says, Safe harbour's a word of rubbish, guys. You promised you'd do this, you haven't. So it's all over. You know, we're not going to we're not going to allow data to be exported out to you anymore. So the US says, well, hold on, we'll, we'll get something in place. Uh, let us carry on for a little bit with us while we get our house in order. And what came out of that was privacy shield. Now the, there's a few things to remember about privacy shield. A, it only applies to the US. B, it only applies to specific companies in the US that sign up to the Privacy Shield. And those companies self-certify themselves. Nobody comes along and says, right, give me your documentation, let's see whether you, whether you comply or not. No, they basically add themselves to a list and say, yeah, we'll, we'll comply, we'll be fine. The only way that they will be reviewed is if somebody makes a complaint against them or if something happens to actually bring them to the attention of the US government in terms of breaking the privacy shield agreements. 
As of today, uh, actually this was as of a few weeks ago, there was 2,739 companies certified by the US. Uh, it's a department of commerce within the US that looks after them. And you can go and look at those, that list of companies at any time just by going to the Privacy Shield site and going to the list. Dead easy to find. Um, it's not completely um, bought into by everybody in the EU. There's a group called the WP, uh, WP29 Committee. What's that sound like heaven? Um, that looks at this and they are not completely uh, happy with the whole thing. They feel that the, the way the Privacy Shield requires people to look after particularly human resource data is too lax and needs beefing up and th there will be ongoing discussions around this but right now it's the best we've got in terms of dealing with companies in the US. So just to sort of put that in context, right, those of you that's got data sitting out there with Dropbox, with Mailchimp, with um, let's see, Microsoft, with Apple, so they fit into the Privacy Shield requirements. Uh, and you'll find that, that pretty much all in there. It's interesting to see who's in there, and it's interesting to see who's not in there. If he that, check the list. Uh, this business about some political party wanting to find out about their voters and insisting that a data centre gives up the information it happened. The US Department told Facebook they wanted details of everybody one day. They told them they wanted full details of a Facebook site where the owners were putting out anti-Trump messages um, during the election. Because they felt that there might have been some election rigging going on in some way, shape or form, they, they weren't exactly clear about what, how that might have come about or whatever. And so if you can sort of see it, you know, somebody's got a, a site that's basically trying to influence a voting, uh, an election. The problem was, it wasn't just the owners of that Facebook site that the Trump administration was demanding. It was everybody who liked that site. So, if, if somebody may have posted up a, a humorous comment on that site and you found it funny and, ah, oh, I like that, that might have been your details that Facebook was giving up as being connected with that website. The next one I just want to talk about is that the Department of Justice says that it can demand every email from every any US-based provider, regardless of where the data center is. And this is pertinent one for this meeting because it was all about information about a particular person that was of interest regarding drugs, and their data was sitting on the Microsoft Irish data center. And the Department of Justice says, no, your HQ is in the US, therefore you will fall under US legislation, therefore we demand you give up that data. Microsoft fought against it, it went to uh, court in 2014, the FBI used a law dating from 1986, the Stored Communication Act, to ask for the emails. Microsoft said no. 
Justice Department did their normal, but hundreds if not thousands of investigations into terror and, uh, terrorism and child pornography are being or will be hampered by the government's inability to obtain electronic evidence if you go down this route. Which means they basically sort of lost, Microsoft sort of lost, however they haven't let it go, they are appealing and the Supreme Court issued a writ seeking a judicial review in October 2017 and the case will be heard again later this year or it's scheduled to be heard again later this year. But it just goes to show, right, you've got a company that's in the Privacy Shield, you've got a data centre that's sitting in Europe and you've got a political regime or a, a, a legislative organisation that's insisting that none of the EU legislation applies in this, in this instance. So, this is why we need to be careful about where our data centres are, which jurisdiction they fall into, and who owns that infrastructure within the data centre, because all of those things can cause our users' data to be insisted upon by somebody that you weren't expecting. And it's not about whether it's right or not, it's about what our customers expect. It's the expectations we need to satisfy. So, that's the data centre. The next place on our journey is the host. Because generally what will happen is, if we come back at it from the other way, we will ask a host to host our, our website, the host will then have a data centre that where they put the data. Once again, the location of that host and the jurisdiction it falls into is just as important as where the data centre is, because they have control over our data within that data centre. Right? We generally don't have direct access into the data centre. We go through our host or our host systems one way, shape or so, what is it we should be looking at when we look for a host? The things I look for are A, do they provide SSL certificates and are they free? I've recently moved from a website provider simply because they wanted something like £60 a certificate for an SSL certificate. It's ridiculous. These days, you've got an open source organization called Let's Encrypt. They offer SSL certificates to anybody who wants them free of charge, or any hosting company free of charge, and lots of hosting companies will provide that onto their customers free of charge. There's no reason we should be paying for SSL certificates these days. If you, does everybody know what an SSL certificate is and what it does? Hands up if you don't. <laughs> oh, right. SSL certificate, when you go to the website, you see the little padlock that turns up and it starts HTTPS <laughs> instead of HTTP. Mm -hmm. That means your data is encrypted over the network, right? And to do that, you need a certificate to initiate that. And that's what the SSL certificate is. Does the host provide SS, SFTP and SSH access? Right, so when we want to load up changes to our WordPress code, the way we might want to do that is through the file transfer mechanism. SFTP is the secure version of a file transfer mechanism. SSH gives the same secure access to the command line within the operating system that's running our WordPress. Why on earth will we need access to the command line? Well, if we want to use this little guy down here, WPCLI, the CLI stands for command line interface. So you need to be able to get to the command line in order to use WPCLI. Why would you want to use WPCLI? All sorts of things. If you use one of the talks earlier on uh, about um, 
we were talking about being able to disable plugins when you've got a, a white screen, if that's what's caused it. Do all sorts of things from a crown line interface when your UI is completely dead in the water. Plus, it's a great way of automating stuff. You can run scripts from the work from the command line interface, which means you can automate things. Brilliant. So, do they give you SSH access into that? What backups facilities are provided by the host? Do you want to use them? If you do, where are they stored? An interesting thing, I had a quick look at the terms and conditions of my hosting provider. And when it came to backups, I found this little statement in the, uh, in the terms and conditions. It says, hosting providers shall not be responsible nor liable for any loss, damage, costs or expenses or other claims, howsoever arising for compensation for any data, file or other material being damaged, corrupted or otherwise affected. Right, so how many of you have got your hosts doing your backup for you and storing your backups? Right. Did you know there might be something in you? Terms and conditions that said that if we lose all your backup data, nothing to do with us, pal. Can't hold us responsible. Now, I'm not worried. I don't keep any of my backups with my host. Because if my host goes down, how do I get to my backups? What does that mean for me? It means I can't go to another host if they tell me. If, you, if again you look into the terms and conditions of this, of this host, it talks about it being reasonable that they get 30 days to get your system back up and, up and going, in extreme cases. Right. Am I willing to wait 30 days to get my websites back up and running? No, I'll go to another host, even if it's only temporarily. I can't do that if I can't get to my backups to restore them somewhere else. When I went looking for a new hosting company, the way I did it was I made a list of the questions I wanted to ask. And I went to WordCamp London. And there was a load of hosts there. And I went round and asked them every question I wanted to ask. It was brilliant. By the end of the, by the, end of the WordCamp, I not only found a host that I liked, that gave me all the answers I wanted, or the correct answers I wanted to the questions I was asking, but that helped me migrate my first three sites over to them before I left the conference. WordCamps are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes? Are you going to tell us who that host is? Uh, Can you? Yeah, They're not in the room. <laughs> cool. 34 <laughs> SP. <laughs> I use those guys anyway, so it's okay. Yeah. Ah, so you didn't know that was in their T's and C's then? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I'm sure, actually, if push came to shove, they wouldn't hang off that because that's such great guys. Right. I want to just get, give you a quick story. I'm going to speed this up a bit because I'm starting to get sort of wind-up type things. I found this little notice in a a host. Now, you can read it for yourself. The, the story behind this was it's an illustration of something that happened to me. I was being, I had one of my sites being hosted by a friend who used a, a third party host for multiple hosting facilities, and that host decided there was unusual traffic coming from my website. So, they closed my website down because it's, they didn't want it taking up all their bandwidth because for a host, that's their most expensive commodity, the bandwidth. So anybody who gets unusual traffic, they close them down until they figure out what's going on and then you know, they, they protect everybody else from that problem. And the problem was, didn't just shut my site down, didn't just shut my account, my, the, the, v, the VM that had got all my sites on, they shut the whole server down. So my friend that was hosting something like a dozen different clients on that server lost everybody on that server. And 
It all turned out after a weekend of badgering because they wouldn't give us give him access to look at the logs to try and find out what was wrong because the server was closed off to it and they couldn't find out who had actually spotted the unusual activity or where the problem had been logged in their fault logging system as he found out that there wasn't any unusual activities at all. Somebody had just been a bit overzealous, pulled the plug on us, and it was out for a weekend. The moral of this story is, is it's not whether or not they pull the plug on you, because they will. You're not going to get away from that. The question is, is how they handle that. We weren't informed. The first thing we knew about it was when I tried to get to my site, it wasn't there. I phoned up my friend and says, where's my site gone? Then he phoned them up and says, oh yeah, we took it down three hours ago. So they didn't tell us. They took the whole server out. They wouldn't let us look at the logs to fix it. So we didn't know what was going on. So we could, so we could fix that. So I say, it's not whether you have a problem, it's how they deal with the problem. So finally, the last step in our data journey is the cloud. Right. Hands up anybody in this room that doesn't use the cloud to hold data. Yep, yeah, that's where I thought. So, once again, it's a bit like the hosting side of things, but there's a couple of extra things to think about here. When you use, when you use your cloud service to store your data, is it encrypted? If it is encrypted, is it just encrypted on their server, or is it encrypted from your client? Right. Dropbox, I don't know whether they still do it or whether they've closed it off now, but certainly a year ago, it was, everything was encrypted on their server side, but everything went in plain from your client through to Dropbox. So all that syncing that goes on in Dropbox, all done in the clear over the network, and only gets encrypted when they get to the other end. Oh, by the way, their staff at the other end have access to the encryption keys. So if they're asked to give up data by their government, then they can't say they can't do it because they have access to the encryption keys. It's not true of all cloud services. There is a particular one called Treasurit, which is based out of Switzerland, that encrypts at the client end as well. And they basically just put their hands up. If anybody asks them for access to the data, don't ask us. We haven't got the keys. We can't give it to you. The only problem is if you go to a service like that, you're responsible for the encryption key. You lose that encryption key, you've lost all your data because they don't know it. You're the only person who does. Uh, what back office services are provided by your cloud storage provider? Dropbox provides some versioning. So you go back a number of versions with Dropbox. Let's get one thing straight. That's not a backup, right? only gets you back a few versions. If you need to go back further, you've had it. The other thing is, that I had it just a few minutes ago, is do they provide a, a data protection agreement? Um, conversations I was having a couple of months ago, and looking at the forums with Dropbox, it will suggest that if you haven't got a business account with Dropbox, that doesn't include plus, it doesn't include standard, they will not give you a data pr uh, processing agreement, which you need if you are storing da user data on their cloud services under GDPR. And of course, the thing about the cloud is, you're never quite sure where it is, where that data is. On the backup side of things, some other questions to ask yourself is what format are your backups in? Is it something that's standard, like RC, ZIP, SQL, or is it in a proprietary format? If it's in a proprietary format, if your host or your backup software 
has a problem, goes, goes south, can you still get to your backups? Have you got some sort of software that they've given you to, to be able to get to it? If you've got to move your data somewhere else, does the receiving system support the format that you've got it in? Have you tested your backups? There's an old saying in IT is, if you've got a backup, if it's not tested, it ain't a backup. So, yeah, have you got somewhere you can test it? An old PC where you can put a local copy of WordPress, try restoring it to that virtual machine. There's lots of ways you can do it. Some hosts, like the one that I'm with, provides actually a, a staging area free of charge where you can actually do that sort of restore. Almost finally, make a plan. So, if something does go wrong, make a plan of what you're going to do about it. When you make that plan, consider a number of things. Passwords. Right? Does whoever's going to restore your system, or you or somebody else, know the passwords? Emails. Will you lose your emails at the same time as you lose your WordPress site? Can you get messages out to your customers? Can they get messages to you? Is your domain name service with the host that's just gone bang? Which means you're going to have all sorts of grief moving that service to somebody else. Not impossible, but it's just a pain. Will you be available or will you as a WordPress person who earns an absolute fortune, you're sitting on a beach in Mauritius for three weeks as part of your four holidays a year, um, when it all goes bang and you can't get back or don't even know it's happened. Have you got a communication plan? What happens to the data that's between you losing that system and your last backup? Right. If you've got an e-commerce site and you're taking thousands of transactions a day or even a week, if it's been a week since you took your last backup, what are you going to do about those transactions you've just lost? What's, what's your plan to keep your customers happy? You can't plan for every event, so you need some sort of backstop plan to deal with the unexpected. But that's all heavy stuff and you know, that's, it's all dead, dead time, is it? It's not. Because once you've got a plan, you can market it. Share your plan with customers and visitors. Hey, if you've got a privacy policy, you can stick it in there. You can tell everybody just how great you are at looking after their data. It also means you can set service levels with customers and get them to pay a premium for those service levels because you're offering something that your competitors may not. So, just to recap, we've got three real places we should be looking at taking care of our customers' data. There's the data center, and that's where we should be looking at where that is and what jurisdiction it comes into. The host, do they have access to your data? Do they provide SSL certificates? Do they provide SFTP and SSH? Do they provide WPCLI? What jurisdiction do they fall under? And then your own data. Have you got encryption sorted out? Do you know what version recovery you've got and what restrictions are around that? And having plans to sort it out. And finally, I'm going to read you a poem. If you know where about your backups are when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on the host. If you can trust your recovery plan when all about what to do, but make allowance for unexpected issues too. If you can be calm and communicate while recovering, or being shouted at, have all the answers. Or being hassled, don't give way to panicky, and yet don't look too good nor blame it on others. If you can talk with support and keep your pride, or walk with techies nor lose the common touch. If neither data loss nor recovery format can hurt you, if all customers count with you but none too much, 
If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of data recovered, yours is the website, website and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll still be in business, my son. And apologies to Rudyard Clickley. <laughs> so, that's me. You can get me at any one of those places. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Woo!